no, God, God is good. He keeps his promises. Even though they don't, they weren't happening. You know, it wasn't being fulfilled. It wasn't coming to pass. Wait a long, long time. And his faith wavered. He stepped out from underneath God's will a couple of occasions. Or this one attempt and then another one where he actually did. God rebuked him. And yet, finally, he push comes to shove, believed God, and the scripture tells us it was accounted to him for righteousness. And righteousness comes by faith, no other way. You can turn to Hebrews 11 if you're not there already. Hebrews chapter 11, we're looking at the depth of faith. We've looked at several examples, and I don't want to take away from any of the examples of faith we've looked at. I don't want to take away from any of those that we're still going to look at down the road. But I don't think there's any other in chapter 11 of Hebrews that gives us quite the depth of faith that Abraham does. And I don't, want to, I don't want to discount Sarah in this account as well, because she's in it. There are those who argue that this is really still talking about Abraham's faith. I, I will explain throughout the course of this message that I don't think we can just put it all on Abraham. I think Sarah is commended for her faith as well in, this, in these verses. We've already looked at this, uh, started this message already, the pilgrimage of faith we looked at this. As Abraham was asked by God to leave his home and just to go to the land, I'm not, you know, I'll, I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, that's not a real, that's not a really easy way to just pick up everything and go, is it? Just, just trust me. I'll tell you later where you're going. Just go. And he goes up to Haran. Spends a lot of time up there too. And the word, the word of the Lord comes again to, to Abram. Abram at the time. We'll just keep saying Abraham because it's less confusing that way. But finally God brought him down to, the, to Canaan. But yet even there he was just a soldier. Or he was just a pilgrim. It, it wasn't home. And he never did receive that inheritance himself personally. But God had promised that his seed would. Because the nation that would come from him would. And on that basis, he just obeyed God. It was a pilgrimage of faith. It had an immediate response to, to God, obeyed him. Uh, so it was an obedient response. And then it certainly required a tremendous amount of perseverance. But he looked for a city. His builder, his maker, was God, it was future. And um, and we're all in the same way, aren't we? We're, we're pilgrims here. This, is, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. We're looking for a city. And we look forward to the return of Christ, and that gives us tremendous hope. We take it for granted. We would probably do ourselves a service if we would, from time to time, meditate and contemplate what if all the promises of God that we have were taken away from us and we had nothing to look forward to. No future in heaven to look forward to. No assurance of anything whatsoever of, uh, coming from the hand of God. <laughs> well, that would magnificently change our perspective. Oh, wow, God is really, truly good. We can persevere in faith. I'll turn, I have to turn as well to the book of Genesis. Um, we're going to have a word of prayer here, but we're also going to be looking, starting in chapter 12 of Genesis, but then looking at Several different chapters. There are portions of chapters. Starting in Genesis 12. I'm going to get myself a little bit better bookmark here so that I can go back and forth a little bit easier. All right. So you have a finger in Hebrews 11 and also one in Genesis chapter 12. Let's have a word of prayer and then we will proceed. Father, we are grateful for your goodness and your faithfulness that you are true to. Every promise you've ever made, and those that have been fulfilled, and those that are yet to be fulfilled. Lord, help us to also discern what you've promised and what you haven't, and not expect things from you that you never said you would do. And yet, even in the midst of all that, cling to what you've said you will do, because you'll never leave us or forsake us. You've never put anything in our path that's not for our good. And you want to accomplish Christ's likeness in our lives. So 
Keep our focus on what you really truly have promised and the spiritual blessings we have if we will have the faith to receive them. Lord, everyone out in this audience here this morning is a little bit different set of circumstances. A little bit different challenges. They're all similar in nature. There's no temptation taken us, but, but that which is, is common to man. We're not lone rangers. At the same time, they have their uniqueness in this time in our lives, perhaps, or just a set of circumstances we're in have their own unique nature. And I pray that you'll touch our hearts where you see the need in each one of us today. We'll be encouraged by your faithfulness and be challenged by the faith of Sarah and Abraham. And may we just persevere. Lord, we certainly acknowledge many who in recent days gone through challenges, trials, difficulties. Thank you for bringing Ken home from the hospital. I pray that he can even just continue to heal up now, grow stronger day by day. Lord, it's been challenging. It's, he's needed to rely on your goodness and your grace and your mercy, your faithfulness. The same is true for Joe and Sally and ongoing challenges they face with physical needs that always come with spiritual challenges. Thankful for how you've taken mercy through her procedure and that you'll continue to strengthen her as well. Without those others, I certainly don't intend to overlook anyone who's gotten through challenges. There's other challenges that we face that are of a different nature. Just lift all these up. The Lord, just again, speak to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, let me shift gears just a little bit here. We're still talking about Abraham, but we're also talking about Sarah. That stands to reason they're a married couple after all. And what affects one affects the other. And they're in this together. You know, Abraham was asked to move, but... You know, he wasn't asked to leave his wife behind. This, she kind of gets uh, uh, perhaps forgotten a little bit. Um, but this impacted a lot of lives, not just Abraham's. And we come here to verses 11 and 12 of chapter 11 in Hebrews, and this is what we read. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky and multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. So here we see an example of power that was received as a result of faith. So we have in Roman numeral three here, the power of faith. Faith is powerful. It, 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 it taps the power of God. On our behalf. So we're going to revisit the story of Sarah here as she is a barren woman. And she's getting older. And in fact, by the point, by the point we start looking at Sarah here, she's beyond childbearing years. And no doubt this has already been a challenge for her. Already been a trial. I don't think things were quite as intense at this time in history as it became for the nation of Israel. But barren, barrenness has never been a pleasant thing. It was especially viewed as a, a stigma. In fact, viewed as a, 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 a really not receiving God's blessing if you did not have a child. And we see why that was so important to the children of Israel as they were each tribe granted an inheritance and and. If you didn't have a child, there was no one in your family tree that the past inheritance belonged to. And it was just, it was just like a slight. We, we, my family won't get to experience God's promises. And people viewed others who were not able to have children with a little bit of disdain. And perhaps like God was judging them. And it was just not a pleasant thing. Now this is before the nation of Israel came into existence. And yet barrenness was still a trial that always has been. And now, 
She's even past the time when she didn't even have children, naturally speaking. But there's a promise given. The initial promise was part of the Abrahamic covenant that God had made or would make with Abraham. And it's really introduced for us here in chapter 12 of Genesis. So if you look there and look at verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord has had said, and so this is looking back at something he had said back when he was still on earth. The Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So here, God doesn't explicitly say to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to give you a child through your wife, Sarah. Okay? It doesn't come out quite that clear. But it's pretty well understood, isn't it? Abraham had one wife. He had Sarah. He's going to have kids. You just assume it's coming through Sarah. And that's a right assumption. That's what God meant. Now, it was, this promise was reiterated right after Abraham and Lot were separated. You remember the story? Lot traveled with Abraham. Lot was Abraham's nephew. And there came a point in their lives when... They had too much between the two of them. They needed to separate, part ways, you know the whole account. Okay? And right after that, we read in Genesis chapter 13, a reiteration here of that promise that God had introduced there in chapter 12. So here in verses 14 to 16, it says, And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that a man, if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. But obviously the fact is you can't number the dust of the earth and you can't count all of Abraham's descendants either. So that's quite a promise to a man who's an old man now and he doesn't have kids, hasn't had kids, and yet he's been given this promise. Genesis chapter 15 then. God comes to Abraham in a vision. And we find Abraham questioning God. Now let's not be too hard on Abraham, okay? Honestly, would you not question God too? How in the world is this going to happen? It's just, let's face it. Have you, you all have had something in your life that you just desire, that you just want. And in fact, you even think it's a good desire that, that, that and you're hoping that God wants it for you. Maybe it's something that you know God does want for you. And you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. And there comes a point where it is incredibly challenging. challenging not to just become cynical. It's like, oh, this is, that's never going to happen. It's just never going to happen. And then you add to something like that, something like in Abraham's case, which was old age, which would just kind of like, just slam the door on even the possibility. So let's, let's not... Let's not be too hard on Abraham here for questioning. Now, I'm not saying it was right. I'm not excusing it, but I'm just saying. We can understand for crying out loud, can't we? So look at verses 2 and 3. Let me just go ahead and start with verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Well, it was a, it was a well known custom in Mesopotamian custom, that is, to adopt a servant as a male heir. Abraham has one of those, he has Eliezer. It was actually been and was born in his household. Not to him, it wasn't his child, but it was a servant. 
Since Abraham hasn't seen God fulfill his promise of a son, and he doesn't see how it will ever happen, he decides to help God out a little bit. Ever been there? <laughs> I've given God so many suggestions in my life. Oh, God, here's how you can do it. <laughs> the, the thing that, the, the, but then, you know, the sin is sin. Cynicism kicks in again. I said, okay, since I thought of it, it ain't happening. Come on, I'm, being, I'm, being, I'm just being open and bare with you. Can you do the same, please? All right? You've done this, right? No, I thought of it. I'm just going to quit thinking about it. And then, you know, as soon as I think about it, it's, it's ruined. It's done. So Abraham's going to help him out here. Gives him this idea. Hey, how about, how about Eliezer? He's a nice servant. Well, God straightened him out quickly here in verse 4. He says, Behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. By Genesis chapter 16, Sarah and Abraham have been have had enough of waiting. I mean, they're still waiting. After all, they're still waiting. And they decided to take matters into their own hands. Look at chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. Now Sarah, Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maid servant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. Think about the time that's gone by here. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived... Her mistress became despised in her eyes. So Hagar became pregnant, and it made her very disturbed with Sarah. Sorry, I. She was despised. She despised her. All right, so this is the scene. So here's another custom that was common in that day. It was, it was culturally accepted, but make no mistake, it was never condoned by God. Not none whatsoever. A woman who was barren to get a child through one of her own maid servants. So Abraham really ignored. Well, yeah, okay, maybe he didn't, but maybe he's still just trying to help God out. You said that this child was going to come from me. It was going to come from my body. Maybe you, maybe, you, maybe you didn't mean Sarah's. Now this is Sarah's idea. So she says, look, mom, she'll just have one by my hand. But I, I have to believe Abraham is also just really not believing God here. As I've said from the beginning, I really think that it was understood that God meant that you're going to have a child for Sarah. What a mistake. What a mistake from that day. And it's, a, it's a mistake because it was frankly immoral. It was not what God designed. It was not what God ordained. It was, it was just man's wisdom. It was just figure out a way to do this on our own, our own way. That, that's why it was a mistake. But all of our mistakes end up being far more far-reaching as far as consequences are concerned normally than we anticipated. And uh, wow, is this not the case here? From that day to the present, the descendants of Ishmael, the product of that relationship, have been a plague on the children of Israel. Ishmael became the father of the Arabs. And every Jew since his birth has faced the antagonism of the Arab world. All because of Abraham and Sarah's sin. So 25 years after the initial promise, when Abraham was 99 years old, Sarah was 89 years old, the word of the Lord came to Abraham again. Chapter 17, verse 1. When Abraham 
was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. We move to verse 15 and we read through verse 19. It says, Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your, Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall the child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and will be descendants and will, excuse me, an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. All right, so here we find Abraham falling on his face, laughing. That's a suggestion. Soon after, Sarah heard the same news. Chapter 18, verses 9 to 15. Now here's where they're, they're visited by three men. We want to be a theophany. God himself. And it says here in verse 9, Then they said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? So he said, Here, so he said, Here in the tent. And he said, I, am, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being also old? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. You know, this isn't the first time she has scorned God's promise. Frankly, she has scorned the promise earlier by initiating the idea of giving Hagar to Abraham. But here's where she is severely rebuked for her scorn. Apparently, she responded to the rebuke because she indeed did conceive, she bore Isaac. Look at chapter 21 now, verses 1 to 7. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken of him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. I won't go ahead and read the rest of the account, but it's, you just see that God, God was faithful. He fulfilled his promise. And some suggest that because of Sarah's past pattern of unbelief, and also that in conjunction with some confusing language in the original, in regard to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11, but the mention of faith here does not really apply to Sarah, but for her. So you go back to chapter 11 here of Hebrews. And verse 11. By faith Sarah herself also conceived. Now it doesn't say, it doesn't specifically say that it was Sarah's faith. It just says by faith. Whose faith? Some say, this is actually Abraham's faith still. We're still talking about Abraham's faith. And part of the reason they say that, too, well, again, besides the pattern of her unbelief, and there's no real, there's no real account of her repenting. Just, she had unbelief. She's rebuked for it. 
But I, I said a moment ago that I believe she did respond to that rebuke favorably. And you'll see why here in just a moment. But there's also this issue of the language here in Hebrews 11.11. 11. The literal translation of the phrase receive strength to conceive is literally to lay down seed. Well, a woman doesn't lay down seed. It doesn't lay down seed that produces conception. That's a man. However, Walvert and Zook in the Bible Knowledge Commentary point out that the phrase not only not, need not only apply to men. The idea is that this is this is sort of like a, a figure of speech. And it just is talking about conception and can involve both man and woman. And I believe certainly as you take the verse as a whole, because look at what the verse says. By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age. Now why? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now this, this is Sarah's faith. She judged him faithful. It took her a while. It took her a long time. We can understand that, can't we? We can understand that. Oh yeah, I'm not excusing it. I'm not excusing the lack of faith. And I'm not excusing it for you and I either. We should just always trust God. He will always keep his promises without exception. And he's always good. And whatever he has in mind is good. Even if you can't see it, it's always good. We save ourselves a lot of grief when we just rest. So, the promise was given. The promise was scorned. But then the promise was believed. And what a power she received. The word here in verse 11, of Hebrews 11, that is translated strength, is the word dunamis. You're familiar with that word, aren't you? You've heard it said before. That's where we get the English word dynamite. And it's more often than not translated power. Sarah herself also received power to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past age. A man as good as dead fathered a child by a woman beyond childbearing years. And God's promise was fulfilled. Therefore, from one man, him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. seashore tongue twister. And that's exactly what God promised. Did it look like it could happen? Not on your life. Humanly speaking, impossible. It's important for us to remember that we can have absolute faith in what God has promised. You know, God, God promised Sarah a son in her old age. She could count on it. And God has made promises, has made promises to you and I. And the fact is, we can count on it. You know, many of those promises are really spiritual blessings. And it's not that we always receive them. But it's not because God hasn't given them to us. It's not because He isn't faithful. It's because sometimes we lack faith. And therefore we forfeit some of the promises that He's given us. Here I'm talking specifically of spiritual promises. Speaking of spiritual endeavors, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 and that is absolutely true. There is nothing in spiritual terms that God wants Paul to do or you and I to do that he doesn't also equip us with everything we need to do it. Or to see it fulfilled in our lives. It reminds us in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. 
of, of him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power that worketh in us. This is really in the context of all the spiritual blessings we have in Christ Jesus in chapters 1 and 2 of Ephesians. It's talking about our spiritual growth, our spiritual maturity, the spiritual blessings we have in Christ. And they are given to us, and if we don't receive them, it's because we lack the faith. The obedience, the response to faith. Perhaps we had faith for a while, but we don't persevere, we don't endure, we give in, we give up. And we forfeit spiritual blessings. God's power is for us to claim Whenever, whenever, whenever that power is desired in accordance with his will. Sometimes we can desire his power with self-centered motivation. But when we desire his power, the things he's promised us for his honor and glory, we can bank on it. There's a lot of things we want. And God is so merciful. He's so gracious. And he really does give us so much that we want. Beyond what we absolutely need. But the fact is, remains that, that God is, is far more concerned that we live victorious Christian lives. That we mature in our walk with him. That we become like Christ. That is paramount in Christ's mind. In God's mind. That's what his passion for us is. It doesn't mean we can't have some things along the way. But if God withholds something from you, it's because he's got a higher goal in mind. And it is for your good and for his glory. What makes that so incredibly challenging is when we cannot see that. And we have to just take it by faith. But that's why this is a life in which we walk by faith, not by sight. There's nothing more frustrating than walking by sight, which means we're trying to figure it out from our perspective why or why not God will do or not do what he does and doesn't do. And when we're constantly trying to figure that out, it's a miserable life. I'm speaking from experience. Ask my wife about a conversation we had before we fell asleep last night. <laughs> but I'm just telling you, it's, it's a, it's, it's, I was miserable for a while. For a moment, it didn't last long, but for a while I was miserable. Because I'm thinking, God, I don't get it. I don't get it. I just yield. Just say, Lord, you got it. You got this. You, you, know, you know what's best. And I, don't think, I can't figure it out. I don't need to figure it out. I just need to trust you. So listen, have, have that kind of faith. That's, that's the kind of faith in the, that will unleash God's power on your behalf. And they'll do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. After the fact, you'll look back and you'll say, wow, God did amazing things. And you know what? The things, the things I were asking for didn't happen. The things beyond what I could ask or think for. That's what happened. That's what God did. I really, really intended this to be a two-part message. It's now going to be a three-part message. Because we're out of time. Can you think of any greater need we have in our life? Then just trust God. Just, just... Father, thank you for the example we have before us in Scripture. And it's not a perfect example. And in some ways, that helps us. Because we know how far from perfect we are. And we know how lacking our faith is. At the same time, we have to acknowledge that the test that Abraham and Sarah had to face was incredible. The waiting 
was probably longer than most of us have had to wait for anything. And the, the reality of them receiving what they were promised was probably, from a human vantage point, less likely than anything we've hoped for. Because it defied the norm and what is even scientifically reality. And yet, Lord, they wavered, and we waver. And yet, ultimately, they believed. And may that be our story as well. May ultimately, ultimately may we always come back to God is good, God is faithful, God is just, He will provide my every need. And He's not just a hard taskmaster who will only give us the bare minimum of our needs, but in fact is a very merciful, loving God who, if we can handle it, will give us even our wants and desires and beyond what we can ever ask or think, even as it pertains to our desires. So, Father, thank you for being that God. May we be a faithful people. Lord, 